spectrum by the area under the curve so I could normalize them to the same magnitude. So you could just see the differences. And you can see there's some places where they're all really tight and other places where they're really far apart. This dotted spectrum down here is just the average of those. It doesn't mean anything except it's like an average of 13 different cultures. But what's more interesting is that if you calculate the standard deviation spectrum, at, so it's a standard deviation at each wavelength, you get the standard deviation, or in this case, the variance spectrum. And so where that's very high, that's in areas where you have very big differences between. And so those would be areas for which you have a broad diversity of pigment composition. And so those might be areas in the spectrum where you might look to see phytoplankton with different pigment composition. So, um, and then if you know where, which pigment uh, absorbs where, you can identify specific features. And I also mentioned to a couple of people that if you take an absorption spectrum and you calculate the first derivative, d a d lambda, where you have a peak, obviously the, grade, the um, derivative will be zero. And so you can use that to help you identify where shoulders are and where peaks are and the, the actual location of, of specific pigments and where they absorb in the spectrum. So other things about phytoplankton and the absorption. So you can have variations due to pigment composition. You can also have variations due to what's called pigment packaging or how much pigment each cell has. And so, um, here, I'll draw on this side. So if you think about a cell, perfectly round cell, with some chloroplasts, and those chloroplasts are where the pigments are. And maybe this one has another chloroplast here. And sometimes if you take phytoplankton and you keep them in low light, they can plaster their chloroplast on the outside of the cell to take advantage of any photon that will come in. If you put them under high light, they sometimes contract their chloroplast to the center to minimize if they're absorbing too much light. So chloroplasts can be quite flexible depending upon the species. So if you imagine that you are looking at a sample that has phytoplankton that looks something like this. And you have a light source and you have a detector on the other side. And if you think about, for each cell, you have a cross-section, right? Some cross-sectional area of the cell or any part of them. And then you have some part of the cell that's absorbing. You could look at the ratio of the area of the part that's absorbing to the whole area of the cell. So you could imagine that for a cell that may be a dead cell that had no chloroplasts, the cross-sectional area would be some um, some geometric cross-section, right? And the area of the absorption could be zero, right? If it had no chloroplasts. So this ratio could be zero if it had no chloroplasts. And what could it be if it's filled with chloroplasts? One. One. So this ratio is going to vary from zero to one. So if we're looking at it this way and we see the chloroplast look like this and you have all this open space, you can also imagine um, filling it in with chloroplasts and that would be your one example. So if the illumination was coming this way, and you were measuring, you had a detector over here that you were measuring the transmitted light through here. If you think about the cross-sectional area that it's seen, right, it's seeing a cross-section this way through the plane. 
So as light comes in, part of it will get absorbed by this chloroplast. Part of it will get absorbed by this chloroplast and this chloroplast before it even gets to the plane of the cross-section that you are looking at. And then part of it is absorbed by the material behind it all the way to the end. So in fact, the path length going through this cell is going through a lot of chloroplasts. So the amount of light that comes out the other end might be that much. It could essentially absorb almost all of the light impinging on the cell. You have a very high absorption coefficient. Now let's say you take a different wavelength where the absorption coefficient isn't as high. So we could imagine that that blue is maybe the peak here. And so let's take an absorption in the purple where the absorption is a little bit lower. Okay? So if we're in a cell that maybe has a couple of chloroplasts, the blue light maybe gets absorbed here, but here, you know, maybe it makes it through the other side, so you have quite a bit of detected light coming through. If you look at the purple, which might be a different wavelength, you won't have as much absorption by the purple, but here, even though the absorption coefficient is lower for a cell, again, it's going to have to go through all of these chloroplasts. And so even if it didn't get absorbed by this chloroplast, because it has a lower probability of absorption, the chances that it makes it out the other side still really, really low. So I'm not trying to draw different colors coming out different sides, but just not very much coming out. Whereas this one has more light coming out and the absorption is less. So if I look at this absorption spectrum, here I have low absorption in the UV, high absorption in the blue. If I look at the absorption coefficient here, I have high absorption in the UV and high absorption in the blue. Because even if this blue light got absorbed here, or here, or here, or here, or here. It doesn't matter. It didn't make it out the other side. And the same thing is true for the purple. Because there's so many opportunities for absorption in this packed cell that has this very long path length. And so the absorption in the blue versus the purple is not very different. And so even if we then look at the green, Oh, I do have green. Okay, so we can shine some green light on there. Even though the absorption coefficient in the green is typically very low, when you have so many opportunities for it to be absorbed by this cell, you still maybe get a little bit more light out. But here, you get a lot more light out. So the absorption in the green for this cell is low, and for this one is pretty high. And it's because there's, there's so much material packed in this cell that regardless of the wavelength, if there is any absorption at all, by the time it makes it through this big cell packed full of chloroplasts and pigments, most of it is absorbed. And so you end up with these really flat peaks and really high absorption in regions where you don't normally see a lot of absorption. And that's called packaging. And so if you look at this um, absorption where it's been scaled, I think, to chlorophyll, but the point is that the shape of the spectrum, where it's very peaked versus where it's very flat, the shape of the spectrum gives you an indication of how much absorption potential is in the cell occurring 
along the path through the cell. So here, there's plenty of open space where there's no absorption. So it might get absorbed by a chloroplast, but if it makes it around that chloroplast, it's just going to head right to the detector. And here, there's just nowhere to go. So the light gets absorbed. So we can think about that. So this would be a large cell with two different amounts of pigment per cell. That's what this case is, a large cell with low amounts of pigment or high amounts of pigment. And what would cause that? What causes cells to do this? Nutrients. Nutrients. So you can limit um, the amount of pigment per cell if you limit them by nutrients. Because chlorophyll, for example, is really rich in nitrogen. That's one reason. What's another reason? Photoadaptation. Photoadaptation. If the cells are in really high light, they're going to try to minimize the amount of light because they have too much light. It just gets re-emitted as heat and it damages the cell. So if you grow them in low light, they'll pack on pigment, either make more chloroplasts or make bigger chloroplasts or make chloroplasts that have more pigment in them to try to maximize um, the amount of light. Certainly not the efficiency because maybe this photon gets absorbed here and this chlorophyll never even sees it. So they have tons of chlorophyll that never even sees light. So the efficiency per chlorophyll is low. The efficiency per cell is high. So phytoplankton balance that out. But um, so that example is like the bottom example. Now, if you look at the difference between a small cell that has a lot of pigment in it and a big cell that has a lot of pigment in it, which one is going to have a more packaged spectrum? So think about light going through, and think about the path length versus the path length. The large cell will be more packaged because, you know, you have a certain opportunity for absorption, and this cell has almost three times the probability of a photon being absorbed. And so it will necessarily have a flatter absorption spectrum compared to a small size cell with the same internal cellular concentration of pigment. Small cells don't package as much as big cells. So when you measure absorption spectra and you see one that's very peaked and one that's very flat, you can, you can begin to suspect a couple of things. Same size cells, different photoacclimation or same photoacclimation, big versus small cell. And you don't know, you have to look for other evidence. Did you collect them at different depths? Did you filter them through different filters? You could begin to see different sizes. But the shape of that spectrum gives you a lot of information about packaged cells. Okay, so that will change the shape of your absorption spectrum. Okay. This is a complicated, um, concept, so you might have to think about it a little bit. And I always encourage people to go back to the original paper, um, but you know, feel free to ask questions later after you've thought about it a little bit, or now. <laughs> um, why else might you see a flatter spectrum? What other environmental variables or constituents might you that? I mean, really what has to happen is you just have a lot, uh, a large opportunity for absorption with, ra with rare opportunity for photons of any color to actually make it out. So. Big cells um, that have a lot of pigment are the most packaged. Small cells that are really a lot of pigment can be somewhat more packaged. You know, comparing this and this, it really depends. You could end up with almost the same spectrum of, say, a small packaged diatom and a large unpackaged diatom. They would have similar pigment composition and might have similar packaging if you look at sort of the absorption per path length through the cell. So it's, it's not a unique thing, but, um, but you can begin to at least see what might cause some variability. Okay, so um, Anik Burko and colleagues um, looked at how you could begin to characterize the differences in the shape from a very peaked absorption to a very flat absorption, and came up with a really nice model to to estimate a um, 
a flat absorption spectrum compared to a peaked one. And what she noticed was that if you go to the open ocean gyres, where the nutrients are really low, and because the nutrients are really low, the cells are really small, because small cells have a uh, diffusive advantage in low nutrient waters. Small cells don't get packaged. So, um, and the low nutrient parts of the water are low biomass. So, when you have low concentrations of chlorophyll in the open ocean gyres, because it's nutrient limited, small cells like low nutrient or can live in low nutrients, and small cells don't get packaged. So you could say that you can tend to find very peaked absorption spectra in the open ocean gyres. Two microns, one micron, cyanobacteria, um, picoplankton. Definitely big. So, in the um, divergent gyres of the ocean, like the North, the North Atlantic mm -hmm. or coastal waters, there's lots of nutrients. Large phytoplankton have a competitive advantage because they can take them up quickly and store them and um, grow quickly. And so, in those regions of the ocean, you tend to have big cells that grow to high concentrations because there's lots of nutrients and big cells tend to be packaged. So you get this co-variability between small cells and large cells, low nutrients and high nutrients, low biomass and high biomass. So what she found was you could predict just based on the chlorophyll concentration what shape of a curve you might expect. Well, that's very cool because you can estimate chlorophyll from satellite. And if you can estimate chlorophyll from satellite, you could say, well, then I know it's very low chlorophyll waters. It's going to be small cells that are unpackaged. So I should expect a very peaked absorption spectrum. So basically you're saying the small cells cannot photoacclimate. They can photoacclimate, but they're so small that their path length is so small that the effect of photoacclimation is so much smaller than if a large cell photoacclimates. So that is because they are very small? Because they are very small, yeah. So this is very powerful. It's a very powerful model. And um, further, um, Marcel Babin uh, looked at, as a function of chlorophyll, what the blue to red peak ratio is, what this ratio is. So. Is it really big or is it really small? Well, it's really big when you have really low chlorophyll and really small cells and really peaked absorption spectra. That's at this end. And that ratio goes down to one, essentially here, when you have really big cells, they're photoacclimated and they're packaged. So again, very powerful. That is a global relationship. And we find this when we look over large scales of the ocean, when we compare oligotrophic gyres to eutrophic coastal waters. However, what about if you're in the coastal waters in the wintertime and the biomass is low? You may or may not have big cells. In the Gulf of Maine, we have big cells in the wintertime. We just have low concentrations of them. And they tend to be light limited because it's the winter time. They tend to be very packaged, but there are low concentrations of them. And so you have to be very careful with this model and models like them because you would predict based on low chlorophyll that you would have this very peaky absorption spectrum associated with small cells. Okay, so looking at the packaging and looking at it as a function of global relationship, you just have to be very careful when you look at relationships like that. If you're looking over the globe, this is beautiful. This predicts 90% of the variability in the ocean. But be aware, big cells are big cells, and it doesn't matter if there's low concentration of big cells, they still can package, even in low concentrations. So 
parameterizing their absorption spectrum just based upon the concentration of chlorophyll in the water. You just have to be a little careful. We're going to return to this because those global patterns drive a lot of the relationships that we see in scattering and absorption and particle size distribution. Yeah, Manuel. Do you want to say something about what you call small cell lens? Yes, I do. <laughs> so, picoplankton. I think Ivana mm -hmm. is going to talk about this. Picoplankton is less than two microns, two to twenty microns, nanoplankton, so you get to see it again, and that way you'll for sure memorize it. Greater than twenty, we call it microplankton. Diatoms tend to be in this size range. Cyanobacteria tend to be in this size range. You can find diatoms in this size range. You can find cyanobacteria in this size range. Right? So you have to, again, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a, sort of a broad sweep to describe large scale patterns. And there's always exceptions, and it's just important to have them. And, and another thing to remember, these models are for spherical, these theoretical models are for spherical cells. And mm -hmm. as you would see with the flow cytoblocks, particularly the big ones, they get less and less spherical. <laughs> right. On average, as they get big. So it's really hard to describe them with a single parameter for all the size. Mm -hmm. And always, we'll talk a lot about size, but it's something you need to constantly, like, constantly be thinking think about. about. What do we mean by size? And particularly if we do things like size fraction the water, if it's a needle-shaped diatom, they can fit down this way. <laughs> they can slide right through a very small. Yeah. So, yeah. So they're able to go from a chlorophyll concentration to an absorption spectrum. Yes. Um, what would they then use that spectrum for? So then you could use that spectrum to model um, reflectance in a forward model. You can use it in, and we will sh I'll show you how to do this in week three, how to in, you know, incorporate it into an inversion so that if you measured an ocean color reflectance spectrum from satellite, you could semi-analytically, which means almost without empiricism, <laughs> <laughs> invert it to derive the inherent optical properties backscattering and absorption by components. And so you could say, well, does it, does, when I take this ocean color spectrum and I break it into its absorption and backscattering components, does my absorption look more like this or more like this? Or more like this shape or more like this shape? Oh, it looks more like this shape. Oh, they must be small. Does anyone ever go in the other direction? Yes, in hydrolyte. You can take this model and forward model. I have a chlorophyll concentration of five. I wonder how different the reflectance spectrum would be if I packaged that five milligrams per meter cubed in one micron cells or 30 micron cells. And you would get very different um, ocean color uh, spectrum depending upon how you packaged the chlorophyll. So yeah, you can use that model in the forward direction. Estimate chlorophyll from the shape of the you could also estimate chlorophyll from the shape of the absorption spectrum because we, um, this is actually absorption normalized to chlorophyll. And so if you measured absorption divided by your chlorophyll concentration, you could then say, well, I could guess my chlorophyll concentration based upon, you know, which shape of the curve or what would be my uncertainty if I estimate. Yeah, Ivona. One other thing, important thing, you know, think about what is this telling you. Don't think how much of the light would that algae be able to absorb. What are they going to do with light? Are going to think in pockets? What are they doing with light? They're going to synthesize, you know? And that's the way you can get really true, to true, give you a good idea about the brown productivity. Do they have brown productivity? Is it going to calculate the carbon, you know, draw down, and so on and so on. So once you can retrieve this stuff from the remote sensor using the some analytical algorithms, you can actually build or use currently developed current productivity models to get a good estimate of the carbon drawdown and carbon production. So it's connected, you know, biology, physics, chemistry. Think about this not just as a function of, this is the measurement of absorption, but what is it, it's absorbing the light, you know? 
what is he doing? Is it like putting back into the biology? Um, and if you can, and if you can identify small versus large cells, they have different photosynthetic efficiencies and different growth rates. So now you can put that into your biogeochemical model, and and compare the differences in carbon fixation rates. It's incredibly powerful. And it's running hydrolyte next week. It has defaults for any input. So there's an option, for example, that says, well, I'm just going to put in a chlorophyll of 0.5 or 5, whatever, and then use those Bricot spectra to get the absorption as a function of wavelength, and then I'll see what the remote sensing reflections looks like, and so on down the road. So you'll be seeing all this kind of stuff over and over again, uh, whether you're doing biology or you're doing radiative transfer theory or whatever. This all gets used by everybody. Yeah. And it's not the only model. There are a number of other models that partition into different sizes and uh, partition by pigmentation. So this is just one example. This is the early, one of the earliest examples of trying to understand um, how cell size translates into variations in the spectral shape of absorption. So we'll give you some examples of that. Yeah. How do I know that what I'm seeing is actually an artifact of the properties of the phytoplankton and not some problem with my atmospheric correction or something else in the earth? Um, so when you say artifact of the phytoplankton, do you mean variability I mean, of the, of a earth. function of the variability yeah. of the phytoplankton? Yeah. Well, so where are you least certain in your atmospheric correction? In the blue, right? That tends to be the area of largest variability where you tend to see negative radiances and it, it tends to be tough in the blue. And of course, that's where we're interested. That's where most of the signal is. So then you think to yourself, well, maybe I'll move to the red. And then of course, that's where water dominates, right? So what you are actually kind of stuck with is this area in here. And so you sort of look at ratios, and this is exactly what most of the band algorithms are looking at. It's the ratio between here to here or here to here, right? And so if you're looking at a, a band ratio, even the chlorophyll band ratio, which I think Kurt's going to talk about, or one of us talks about, you know, you look at the ratio due to this phytoplankton, in between two different bands and then this one. So you can have that much change in absorption for the same chlorophyll concentration. And that just comes out in the wash of the NASA algorithm, right? When you see the variability of the curve of the band ratio and all the scatter of the data points around it, that's this. So exploiting this is the next step. You might use the NASA chlorophyll algorithm to give you a first guess of chlorophyll, and then you see a variability, and you say, okay, am I always above the line? Am I always below the line? Well, what does that mean? Maybe I always have packaged phytoplankton. And so that would allow you to begin to explore that relationship and how it fits for your area. So anytime you don't get a match, it's an opportunity to dig deeper. When you get an answer and it matches, like that's just boring, really. It's time to like move more. Yeah. This is, for nomenclature's sake, we call these type of models bio-optical models. So you see a lot during this class people refer to them as bio-optical because it's, a, it's a, an optical model, so to predict absorption and optical property, but using a biological or biochemical parameter in this case of morphine. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, phytoplankton aren't the only fish in the sea. And they're not fish at all. <laughs> Joke, see if you're awake. Um, these are absorption spectra of ciliates and flagellates, so heterotrophs. They tend to have a peak here around 412. That is the cytochrome 412, which is um, a cytochrome that's in mitochondria. It's responsible for respiration. So there's actually an absorption peak associated with that. If you have a bacterial bloom in the ocean, you sometimes see this peak, and you can estimate the concentration of bacteria from the height of that peak. And you don't want to swim in that water 
because it's nasty. Um, so heterotrophic bacteria, ciliates and flagellates, um, they have that sort of exponential shape from blue to red with the cytochrome on top. Um, if you look at the non-algal particle absorption, this is after you've done the extraction. This is the same paper where I digitized everybody's data. I looked at the published mean, which had a flatter slope than CDOM. Okay, um, yeah. Can go back one slide. Yes. Um, so comparing to the absorption, absorption of chlorophyll, what is the magnitude of this one? Small. Like, do I see signals of this type you of can spectrum? You can see this when you don't have a lot of phytoplankton and you do have a lot of bacteria and your bacteria are healthy <laughs> um, so you know dirty water okay. sewage plumes water sewage plumes yeah <laughs> yeah e coli yeah <laughs> so so the non-algal particles as a function of wavelength, also have an exponential shape to their absorption, which is similar to the exponential of CDOM, although CDOM tends to be steeper. So the slope here is about minus 0.018. The slope here is about 0.01, which doesn't look hugely different, but actually results in a very different spectrum. And so I again compared this with um, Marcel's work in the European coastal waters, and again, for his 300 samples, for I don't know how many samples I had, very different technologies, um, decades apart, and again, the means of the slopes of those spectra are very robust and significantly different from CDOM. So although they have a similar shape, there is a very big difference in slope. And it seems that if you begin to look at, if you think about what these materials are, the organic part of this non-algal particle is organic particulate matter that could be living or dead. This is the degraded, dissolved fraction that was once particulate matter. And so you can imagine that you're looking at a biogeochemical transition from particulate to dissolved. And you're seeing a transition from a flat slope to a steep slope. And so if you look at the variability in the shapes of these curves, it can again begin to tell you, give you a little bit of information about the biogeochemical processes occurring in the water from something that's sort of freshly dead to potentially something that's more degraded. And so there's a lot of information in this slope. So if you make good quality measurements, you can interpret the variability in this slope and look at its spatial and temporal patterns. It's quality. It's proxy. Yes? Yeah. Uh, this battery first wavelength uh, profile is in the mirror image. Right? The one, one minus the absorption. <coughs> If you were to plug the scattering coefficient against wavelength, you just need to know these and it's one minus this. So these are both absorption. Right, I want to go to scattering and I can't because, I mean, the scattering coefficient because this is the absorption coefficient. This is absorption. So you already want to jump into scattering by particles. I'm just wondering if I can infer one curve from the other. So, CDOM is dissolved, so it doesn't scatter. No particles. I mean, yeah, no particles. It doesn't scatter, but if this is the absorption coefficient, shouldn't that be one then? Because everything is absorbed. I mean, if it's not absorbed, it's not so what's it? I think uh, it's normalizing by attenuation. So, if we think of attenuation as equaling absorption plus scattering, right? Yeah, that's what I For CDOM, Attenuation equals absorption. Yeah. yeah. And scattering equals zero. For non-algal particles, it depends on their size. 
but B does not equal zero for particles. It depends on their size, it depends on their composition, and we'll get there on Thursday. But you can tell the difference. If you have yellowish water and it's turbid, you've got scattering, so it's probably this. If you have yellowish water and it's clear, it's this. Is that the question? Right. Think, about think about it and ask again. Yeah, Emmanuel. So, what, what Colin is presenting is the consensus. The reason, however, there's work now based on inversion, not direct measurement, where people claim that CDOM does scatter in a significant way. Nobody has ever measured it, but you'd see it as a proposal mm -hmm. thing. They particularly work by uh, Jack, where he does inversions of scattering matrices, and the only way he can explain it using his model is by inventing particles that are really small. That's his explanation. But nobody has ever measured it. So just so you be aware, I mean, what Colin presenting is the consensus. It might be that in two years we'll say, well, we were wrong. We, not, we were wrong. We now believe it does scatter significantly, but nobody today has convinced us that it does. Well, but you can get so CDOM is such an operational definition. It depends on your filter, right? So some people filter through 0.2, some people filter through 0.7. There are colloids that are submicron particles. That will be in those fractions, and they can be created and destroyed quickly, depending upon chemical, the chemical environment. A 0.7 micron particle is going to scatter light. Okay, so when we say CDOM doesn't scatter, well, most of the time. <laughs> as far as we know. As far as we know. We have not measured it, but that doesn't mean that you won't measure it. Another way to look at this is, first of all, there are no dissolved substances. Everything is a particle, mm -hmm. right down to those size of water molecules. Well, water scatters significantly. It's a bunch of particles that scatter significantly. CDOM's also a bunch of particles. It's just big molecules with molecular weights of like 80,000 as opposed to 32 or something for water. So it does scatter, for sure. The question is, well, is it significant? Well, there's not enough CDOM molecules to really matter for how much scattering they do compared to how much absorbing, should, how absorbing they do. But of course, if you put enough CDOM in there, you're going to eventually have enough molecules that the scattering by those CDOM molecules will some start showing up somewhere or another. But they have to be, not only do they have to be a lot of them, but they have to scatter more than the water molecules right. that they replace. Right, and so the consensus has always been that, yeah, CDOM might scatter a little bit, but compared to all the other things, water and chlorophyll and so forth, it's just totally negligible. And that's kind of where it stands at the moment. So here's the microphotometry that um, Triaga and Siegel did where they measured the absorption by the individual particles and you can see the nice spectral shape. There's, you know, so it's like some detrital pigments, maybe that's a fecal pellet. Um, uh, Norm Nelson did some work where he looked at phytoplankton and then he put the phytoplankton cultures and bleached them with really, really strong light. So photo bleached them. Like a, um, and you can see that the pigments get oxidized and bleach out, and you're starting to um, sort of evolve into a detrital or non-algal particle absorption spectrum. So that can happen as you bleach out your pigments. So it tells you a little bit about what's in the water if it's organic. Now, non-algal particles, remember, are all the particles minus the pigments. So it also includes inorganic particles. And it turns out that Inorganic particles also have this sort of exponential shape, except maybe a couple of features in here. So this is some work by um, Marcel and Darius Stramsky, looking at Saharan dust and some sediment that came in at Spitsbergen and an Australian sample. And you can see that they also have this strong absorption from blue and very small in the red. Um, Patterson measured, did the same measurement in, of Saharan aerosols, 
air, so airborne um, part of uh, particulate matter. In 1977, this is on a log scale, so the exponential becomes a line. But you can see that all of these inorganic particles also have this strong blue absorption and weak red absorption, just like organic material. Um, Mega Stapa, who was a student here and graduated, I don't know when, um, close to here. She was measuring suspended sediments and noticed that even in the more mineralic sediments that she had, that there were some of these weird shoulders. She did a derivative spectrum. So you could see these very strong features in the derivative. And it turns out that where those peaks occurred are the um, wavelengths at which um, the iron oxides, iron oxidized minerals go through a state or a phase, a state transition when they're changing the, um, the valence charge on the iron. <laughs> and so she used this, these, the, the difference between these two peaks to estimate the iron concentration of the mineral particles due to absorption. I know, again. There's so much information in the absorption spectra. And so anytime you see these features, you just don't know what they are. And everyone thought this was organic coating or something. This was not organic coating. She removed all the organics. It's due to iron oxide. So, so that's what's in your non-algal particles too. Organic and inorganic, living and dead. So don't call it detrital particle. Don't call it detrital matter. You see in the literature a lot of time, A sub D, A detritus. It's not detritus. The living viruses are angry at you for doing that, and the bacteria, and the zooplankton, and the inorganics. So it includes all of this stuff. So to model the impacts of absorption, you just add them all up. These are open ocean waters with mostly water. These are coastal waters with some sea dom in them. Here's some phytoplankton rich waters, which have like really high absorption and even pigments that you can see very clearly. And so by adding them all up, you can figure out what's in the water. <laughs> this one's water, this one's sea dom, and this one's phytoplankton. So the shape of the absorption tells you which constituent is dominating. And we'll refer, re return to this paper, Morel and Prior. It's one of my favorite papers in the world. Um, so it will We'll spend a lot of time looking at the absorption spectra and how that plays out in ocean color. And so you'll get more in absorption. You're going to hear about phytoplankton absorption tomorrow. We're going to measure absorption. Talk about measuring absorption. We're going to measure absorption. <laughs> we will be absorption. You will be absorbing absorption. And then this will be um, the dissolved. This will be the particulate. So more absorption to come. But if you have any questions, just ask, now or later. So, that's the $64,000 question. So, sometimes you can have luck by measuring the particles, extracting the pigments, measuring it again, and that's your non-algal particle, and then you can put your filter in an oven at 500 degrees C and burn off the organic matter and measure it again. The problem is that sometimes the mineral particles are coated with organic and so your absorption goes up after you burn off the organics because now you're exposing the underlying minerals that weren't a part of your original absorption. So, there you go. <laughs> so it depends on, it, it depends on your environment. I've, I've gone through that, you know, I had a student, actually Jeremy, <laughs> who will be here in a couple weeks, went through and looked at that process and was able to actually, in the environment we were working in, separate um, phytoplankton, non-algal organic and non-algal inorganic into three components and got retrieved it by closure and by the individuals. And then you're like, great, we've got this great method. You go somewhere else, just doesn't work. So.
And some people look at, Meg looked at using a chemical oxidizer, but it's the same thing. If you've got a piece, if you've got a grain of sand and you cover it up with organic, if you burn off the organic, that optical property of that sand was not part of your original absorption. So, can't help you. <laughs> if we don't it's a great any, idea. Yeah, if we don't have any field sample, then it's really hard to say that. And even if you have a field sample, you can look at it and it can look like nice grains of sand, but they can be grains of sand coated with organic matter. And so they absorb like organic matter. Turns out they're going to scatter like inorganic. So sometimes if you do scattering and absorption, you can separate that out. Yeah. Okay, introductions, right? Oh yeah, we're not going to post your...